So this podcast is on complications of uh, central venous catheter or central line as we commonly call it. So the most important one is actually central line associated infections. You know, it's very common. So there are two terms associated with central line infections. First is CRBSI, that is catheter-related bloodstream infection. And the second is CLAPC, CLA, BSI, central line associated bloodstream infections. And these have actually originated from CDC America. And it's very important to understand the difference between the two. CRBSI is confirmed central line infection, while CLAPC is probable central line infection. It could come from other sources also. So how do you diagnose it and when do you suspect it? Suspicion is easy, right? There's a central line, patient develops fever or hypotension, PLC goes up, procal goes up. There's no obvious source, so you think there's a central line infection. Now, what do you do? So you have to send a culture, blood culture from your central line and one from the periphery, not from the IV cannula. You have to take a fresh puncture and you send the cultures. So you have sent the cultures and now you have to wait for the report. The report takes anything like 24 to 72 hours. What do you do with the central line in the meantime and do you start antibiotics? So you do not remove the central line. Okay. Only if the patient is in septic shock or is immunocompromised and there's a strong suspicion of uh, central line infection, you remove the uh, central line. Okay. And of course, you start the antibiotics. Okay. If the patient is hemodynamically good, there's only a mild fever, you can wait for the antibiotics also. That's a subjective decision. Now, the cultural report comes back. Both the central line as well as the peripheral line cultures are positive. Okay. So, what do you do now? What is the interpretation? Supposing there was a UTI, right, or there is an abdominal source of infection, that will also lead to bacteremia. And that will also lead to central line and peripheral line culture positivity. So here comes in the concept of DTP. So what is DPT? Differential time to positivity. So this actually means that there is a difference in the time taken by the central line culture and the peripheral line culture to become positive. The central line culture should become positive at least two hours before the peripheral line culture becomes positive. That is known as differential time to positivity or DTP. Then that happens because the central line culture will have a higher density of bacteria. So it will become positive earlier. Okay. So if the DTP is two hours or more, that is confirmatory for central line infection. Very occasionally, you may not get DTP uh, more than two hours. In that case also, this is taken as a central line infection. Uh, but uh, you have to be careful, you know, clinical context also has to be taken into consideration. Now, what about the situation where only one culture becomes positive? That is you, either the central line or the peripheral line. So here, you know, this is the concept of CLAPSI. If there's only one culture positive and not both the cultures positive. This is called CLAPSI and this is a probable central line infection because it's not confirmed, right? There could be abdominal source which is causing bacteremia and you're getting only one of the cultures positive. So again, the clinical context becomes positive and sometimes you can get a skin contaminant like staph and It is not uncommon. So what do you do here now? Is it the skin contaminant or actual culture positivity? So here again, you have to repeat the cultures. And if you get two culture positive for a skin contaminant, then it is taken as a two infection, two bacteremia. So that this is CLAPSI, the latter part that I told you. Okay, one culture positive. For a pathogenic organism or two cultures positive for a skin contaminant. And you have to treat this with antibiotics again. Now, what antibiotics? So antibiotics, like anything, is dictated by the kind of organisms you are having, what kind of resistance you are having. Now, what about the central venous line tip? Do we send that for culture? Now, the concept is that central line tip can be sent only if you remove the central line, right? And when do you remove the central line? Only if you have a confirmed central line infection. Otherwise, you don't remove the central line because you 
can't be putting in center lines all the time. It's not a small thing to put in a center line. You get complications. It costs the patient, right? It's a procedure. So center line tip is not sent because you have to remove the center line to send the tip. Otherwise, the center line tip is actually having the maximum positivity. You send that and you send a peripheral culture. That will give you the maximum positivity. However, it is not sent. But if you are removing the center line for some reason, then you can send it if you want to do a culture sensitivity. Now, the other thing is, what is the duration of antibiotics here? So the minimum duration will be seven days. And before stopping that, you have to send blood cultures. Blood culture should be negative. And then only you stop the antibiotics. For staff warriors and for Canada, the minimum duration is 14 days. And again, your culture should be negative, negative before you stop the antibiotics or antifungal if it's current. So that was about central line associated infections. And, you know, overall the stats are that most of the times when you think that there is a central line infection, there is no central line infection. The source is somewhere else. Or the cause of the fever is non-infectious. 50% of the time when you think that there is an infectious source of Fever in the ICU is non-infectious, even if there's a rise in PLC and CRT. Please remember that. Now, moving on, a very important thing is the <coughs> position of the CVP tip when you put the center line. All you guys can put the center line, fair enough. You do the X-ray after that, fair enough. Now, what do you see in that? So, first of all, the quality of the X-ray should be good, okay? Good means there should be no rotation. 75% of the X-rays taken in the ICU are suboptimal. And that is primarily because of rotation. The patient is, you know, always lying in the bed and they have to be moved around and put in the proper position. The X-ray has to be taken properly. And when it's taken properly, the CVP tape should not be below the level of the carina. The carina, at that level, you have the SVC and the RA junction. And it should not be going beyond that, deeper than that. Okay? Because if it goes into the RA, then you can get complications. Also, you have to see the silhouette of the heart. It should not be going beyond the silhouette of the heart. Otherwise, it means it's penetrating into the wall of the heart or the SVC. That is another very important thing. These two things should be checked clearly. And of course, you check for pneumo and all those things. So the position of the CVP tape balancing is very important. And if it's not correct, then you have to reposition it. Please make sure because complications are not so uncommon. One, because there are numerous complications. And second, there are so many central lines put in the ICU every day. Okay, that is the thing about central line complications. So we move on now. Now coming to the traumatic complications. One is pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is not so uncommon. And it occurs initially only when you're trying to puncture it. When you're trying to insert it, then you, get, you puncture the pleura. And when you puncture the pleura, you get a pneumothorax. Pneumothorax may come up that time only when you do the x-ray, or it may come up four or five days later also. Because patient is supine most of the time in the ICU, and on the supine film, you cannot make out the pneumothorax so easily. So it keeps increasing, increasing, and suddenly after four or five days, you get a pneumothorax. And everybody has forgotten that there was CVP inserted four or five days ago, and uh, the correlation is not done. So it's important to realize this, that even after four or five days, you can get a new move. So you get a new move, you have to put an ICD if it's a big new move. Okay, that is the thing about new move. The other thing is plural effusion. Sometimes you get a plural effusion also. Sometimes you get a plural effusion also. And uh, once the plural effusion appears, uh, you have to diagnose it. That is to do a central line. So you aspirate it, you send it for analysis. And then on analysis, you get a very dilute kind of a fluid. And the fluid constituency will be just like a uh, IV fluid. By the way, if you were running normal saline or glucose before that, it'll have those con contents in it. And there might be some RBCs and blood because of the perforation into the vessels, etc. And it's important to realize that pneumothorax and fluid effusion can occur on the contralateral side also to the side you write the puncture and the catheter was put. That, that's very important to realize. Now, moving on to the bleeding related incidents. So, you have two very important ones. One is hemothorax and the other is cardiac tamponade. So, if you get any of these, it's very serious, right? Especially cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is not so common, 
but if it occurs in the mortality of 50 percent right it will be manifested as dyspnea drop in blood pressure and is not picked up so often and once you get a cardiac tamponade or a hemothorax hemothorax you diagnose again by aspiration if you opacity in the hem hemothorax you aspirate you get blood if you get a hemothorax or a suspected cardiac tamponade you need to call the guys you know you not need to call the cardiologist and you need to call the the cardiothoracic surgeon sometimes so you have to intervene and remove the catheter and uh, stabilize the patient. These are serious complications. Now, the other complications which are common are thrombosis. Sometimes you can get thrombosis uh, related to the catheter. This can go up to the IJV or into the upper extremities from the subclavian vein and it manifests as fever, swelling, edema and rising TLC, etc. So what do you do for this now? So first of all, one has to see what is the extent and whether your CVS catheter is working or not working, your central line. So if the catheter is totally blocked, then you have to thrombolize. You take antiplase, two milligram, put it in there and let it be there, okay? And see after two hours whether it has opened up. Or if it's not opened up, put another two milligram, wait for two, three hours and see if it has opened up. 90% of the time, this will open up the catheter. And dissolve the thromboid. That is the way to go about it, the easier way. If the catheter is open, you know, there is some partial thrombus, then you can just go for anticoagulation also. And removal of the central line is not necessary in these situations. It does not alter the, you know, prognosis. So a little bit of clinical judgment is required, but generally, antiplase works wonderfully in these situations. Now, the other thing is there can be microthrombi also in the catheter, central line. And sometimes there are microthrombi due to clots and sometimes there are precipitates, right? Because you're giving infusions, so you can get precipitates in the central line. And these can lead to occlusion and they can hamper the flow of fluids and drugs, etc., whatever you want to give. So here, you know, one has to flush with the saline, try to flush it with the saline or with heparin to break the microthromboi and they often work. Sometimes there's kinking in the catheter, then this will not work. And you'll have to just replace it. And you know, this, this catheter occlusion with microthromboid precipitates is also very common. All these things are very important because you have to maintain the central line. You know, you can't just go on replacing and removing the central lines. So this is, uh, you know, some of the troubleshooting aspects of the central line complications. Now, moving on to a very important aspect that is the flow rates in the different ports. So there are three ports, right? And the flow rates are 60 ml per hour, 60 ml per hour, and 80 ml per hour in these ports, depending on their gauge size. So now let us assume multiple infusions are going on, okay? Three infusions are going on through one port. And the total infusion rate is more than 80 ml of these three infusions. And one of them is noradrenaline patient is in shock. A sister has connected noradrenaline and let's say soda bicarb and another normal saline is also going on through this. And the total infusion rate is more than 80 ml. So one of your infusion will stop here. And supposing noradrenaline stops, you will get hypotension suddenly. So one has to be aware of this, how many infusions are going on through the ports. And what is the total flow rate? Now coming to the final part of my podcast, what about the platelet count and the INR that is necessary to put in a central line? So many times you have coagulopathies. So guys, there is no fixed number. Okay, despite central line being such a common procedure, there is no standardized number. Platelet count should be more than 50,000. That is the general consensus. And INR should be less than two. There was a recent study in the NEGM last year in which they looked at the platelets and whether they should be requiring platelet transfusions. And they saw that if they did not give platelet transfusions at a platelet count of less than 50,000, there was more bleeding. So you give the platelet transfusion if the platelet count is less than 50,000. And also if INR is more than two, then you have to give uh, FFP or cryo or whatever required, right? And you know, you should not wait for too long once you're given your STP and Cryo and all immediately you should put the central line. Bleeding can be very serious once we had a patient of dengue 
and uh, patient started bleeding. He couldn't stop it. It was a massive hematoma. The airway got obstructed, and there were a lot of complications. So patient almost expired. You know, it was so bad, but he managed to salvage him. <clears throat> the other thing is there are numerous complications with central line. These are very rare. For example, a embolism. Then stroke can also occur. Okay, if there's an arterial puncture and all, you can even get a stroke. You can even get brachial plexus injury. Multiple complications can occur. And uh, these are more common uh, if you are careless or when, uh, when you are starting your central line uh, insertions, you know, even when you are early in the career. And finally, central line is a procedure where consent is not necessary if there's nobody to give consent and it is a life-saving procedure. For example, there's no venous access, patient is in distress, crashing, and there's no one to give consent, you can go ahead with putting the central line, there is no problem, but you have to document it because you have to save the life of the patient. So guys, that's all I wanted to say, troubleshooting, central line complications, and any questions, comments, as usual, please put them up in the chat box. Any comments, feel free, no problem, sir. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.